All right. So when we think, uh, what we really love about immunotherapy as oncologists is uh, pretty similar, I think I would, I would say as um, vaccinologists is really the, the function of the immune system being adaptable, specific, long lasting, universal. So meaning like immunotherapy in a cancer setting can hopefully induce durable immunity. It's, it's hopefully not so toxic, so really specific and also can potentially be used in, in any kind of tumor. And so that what really changed the field over the last 10 years in terms of cancer immunotherapy, really providing a new platform for cancer therapy has been immune checkpoint inhibition. I'm just introducing the two main checkpoints that we have been targeting in the clinic. But while it's actually really just mainly PD-1 and PD-L1, but CTLF4 certainly came first. And so the data in melanoma now published more than 10 years ago, um, and this is actually from a larger cohort, several thousand patients, um, showed something that you would probably, as being in a vaccine field, like, oh, this is like KM course, it looks terrible. Well, actually, for melanoma doctors, it actually looks pretty, pretty like a, at least a good start. And the main reason for that, I'd, I'd argue, is the, the fact that this core curfew actually plateaus out. And it's a little bit higher than you would expect it for. So it's usually um, the expectation for an advanced melanoma patient is like living a, a, maybe eight months um, on average. And so only like 5% of patients are alive after five years. And so seeing 22% being alive at, two, at um, three years and then just going on for like 10 years was certainly a big deal. But what really changed the field was the, the other, was, was the other immune checkpoint, which is the PD, PD-1 um, checkpoint, which, which was also tested initially in melanoma and, and also in lung cancer. And it showed just remarkable response rates up to 45% in, a, in the initial setting. And what was probably even more surprising to many oncologists and immunologists was at the time that lung cancer could actually respond to this as well. And that really gave it a big platform. In melanoma, we also relatively early on learned that when we combine targeting against PD-1 inhibition and CTLF-4 inhibition, we can get really like tremendous increase in the in this response rate and actually, in fact, see very um, rapid and, and deep responses, as you can see in these like what we call spider plots, where I actually look at uh, tumor regression. This is basically looking at the, the percentage of decrease on a CAT scan, and these waterfall plots show this. Um, for individual patients, I can see that the majority of patients uh, had re clear responses, some of them actually complete responses. And when you look at the, the PFS curves, it's also quite a bit better than what I showed you with epilimumab. Um, so this field has exploded now. PD-1 inhibition has, as I mentioned, lung cancer was only the first. We did signal finding trials where we fairly early on learned that uh, of really a whole number of, of tumors can respond to this treatment. Um, and so this is reflected here on the left side, where you see essentially the, the different icons here are just like different uh, PD-1 inhibitors. This is like a spectrum of 20, more than 20 different tumor types. And you can see over time, like the number of FDA approvals. But what you can also see on the right on the right side in terms of the response rate of these uh, uh, PD-1 inhibitions, so these are FDA approved drugs. They're actually not that great for the majority of, of tumors, right? So there's tumors where it did have FDA approved drugs but a response rate is still kind of only 10%. And even the best ones like Hodgkin lymphoma, the response rate is somewhere about 80%. And what all these like red dots here is the, the durability. So response rate is not necessarily like a long response. So there's certainly a lot of, a lot of room to, to work with. So a lot of like improvement. And so you, an important question is of course, like, well, why are the responses relatively low? Why does, why does there only, you know, some patients that, that respond? And so, uh, what we think of so as a generalization, a patient that gets a PD-1 inhibitor, a tumor needs to be inflamed, so to speak. So the T cells have already been there, you know, they, they have been endogenously primed. They're sitting there in a the tumor, and all the PD-1 inhibition is doing is basically releasing this checkpoint. But of course, even that setting, there could be exhaustion, it could be like even a suppressive circuit. But then, of course, you could also have a tumor where um, the T cells don't, they, they make it to the tumor, but they actually don't make it inside there. So there could be stromal barrel, barriers, could be vas vasculature, chemokines, and so forth. And then you can have these like completely cold tumors where there's essentially no T cell infiltration at all. This could be related to no priming, right? So basically there hasn't been like any tumor specific re uh, response that has been like in initiated in that patient. Maybe that's not enough antigen. This is just to like illustrate the complexity of all this. Right, the, the immune sort of the clinical immune oncologists, they'll have loved sort of this 
this cancer immunity cycle where basically this was like by uh, Daniel Chen and, and, um, and Ira Mailman 10 years ago basically sort of created this where they say that, well, the, the tumor antigen basically gets released, it gets it gets loaded onto antigen presenting cells, they're moved to the lymph node, they're prime T cells, those T cells then traffic and they traffic back into the tumor. And you can look at this in a, in a circular fashion. It can, you can basically make an effort to find a lot of different mechanisms why there's a lot of things that are that, that can go wrong that can explain these different phenotypes that are shown on the, on the right side. And of course, you can look at these mechanisms as like, well, Jesus, this is, uh, this is like really complicated. How can a- anything ever work? So it can be like really pessimistic, or it could be also optimistic and say like, well, there's a lot of like targets that he can work with, a lot of mechanisms. And I, I would I would argue like PD one inhibition is actually an example of a, probably a, a dominant pathway where we where we see we can actually, in, at least for the, the tumors that respond, we can essentially cut through all this complexity of inhibition and all these things that can go wrong with the tumor with tumor immunity and basically achieve clinical clinical activity. And sort of based on the this the, the assumption that one can just one just has to combine with sort of the right therapies. There's been hundreds, actually thousands of trials that have been ongoing over the last ten years testing PD one and so really the PD one inhibition has been the platform, and there were there's done just like a multitude of other um, additional agents that have been added, or they just have been added on onto like traditional oncology therapy, like chemotherapy. So there's a lot of like therapies where um, rather than using some sort of sophisticated, potentially synergistic combination, it's basically what's just loaded on like chemotherapy plus PD-1 inhibition. And actually, a lot of these regimens are approved in the clinic now. Uh, but nevertheless, I'd say from an, you know, a, a visionary immuno, immuno, immunotherapist 10 years ago would have like thought like, oh, hopefully like in 10 years, we'll actually have all these like uh, regimens where we can like characterize the tumors, we have predictive marker, we, we t- tailor like combination therapies based on this. And I, I would argue that it kind of hasn't happened. There's like some exceptions, um, but we are pretty much like most of the, the approvals of PD-1 inhibition, PD-L1 inhibition, it hasn't really, you know, moved that much forward. There's so, certainly, there's CAR T cells, which we don't have time to, to go over. So there's certainly some improvements that have been made. There's been some other like checkpoint inhibitors like LAC3 inhibitors that have now shown activity in melanoma, but by and large, um, not so much uh, progress. So for us uh, at Dana-Farber, but for other uh, people, including actually we're saying at Biontech, 10 years ago, the question was like, well, or I mean, even for, of course, like we all we thought for a long time that vaccines actually may help. And at least like for this these cold tumors, they may be able to drive um, T cells into the tumor. So I just wanted to, so this is like sort of stating the obvious, but uh, in the infectious disease vaccine field, it's really, we, we're talking about preventive vaccine, right? So it's usually healthy individuals versus in cancer, it's usually either patients who have active disease, meaning like actually metastatic disease that, that you can see on a scan, or there are patients that have surgically resected disease um, where we are worried about like a recurrence. I so mean, like we would call it secondary prevention. But what do we want to achieve with a cancer vaccine? I'd argue, well, we want to generate a de novo tumor specific T cell response and we want to amplify pre existing responses, potentially like increase the, the breadth and the diversity of the tumor specific T cell repertoire. Now, um, again, pa- pathogen cancer, obviously not the same. So what are the differences, right? Um, so certainly like, for most of virus, um, and uh, some of you may may disagree, but it's certainly like typically a viral a virus is something that's foreign and new, and that should cause immune immunogenicity because of the, the host is naive. There are certainly exceptions like TB and malaria, but by and large, this should be like a, a lower bar. Versus in cancer, the, the 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 cancer vaccine has to from the get go deal with like gen- heterogeneity, immune evasion. And then a host that has an a, a immune response that's ongoing for quite some time because the tumor has been evolving for potentially years, even T cells are already exhausted. So it's a, a different playing field. Um, and then you could also like think about uh, sort of the tumor evolution in a little bit more. So I don't really have the time to go like in, de- in depth here, but there's this cancer immuno editing hypothesis, or you know maybe it's more than a hypothesis by now, where basically the thought is that 
essentially most cancers in the beginning are recognized by the immune system, but then they sort of they they're controlled in the beginning, but then the tumor sort of learns learns to get around it with like many many uh, mechanisms. It could be like immune evasion, it could be like simply down regulating tumor antigens, it could be other immunosuppressive circuits, and so forth. And so um, in the cancer vaccine field, we actually Think about a lot of the, the same questions that we, the, so with all these differences, the, the question and like when we, when we talk about trial design and how to, uh, how to come up with the best cancer vaccine is like so, a lot of the, the conversation are very similar. So we also have like obviously thinking about different platforms. We think about dosing, scheduling, um, adjuvants, how to come, you know, something that's probably a little bit more specific to a cancer vaccine is like, well, what are the partnering therapies? Or can we should we give with PD one inhibition? Should we add other agents? We were probably a little bit more um, sort of flexible in that sense because the patients are are sick and we are we are allowed to so to speak to to do more to add on more more agents. Uh, arguably, the antigen is the the biggest challenge to cancer vaccines, right? So for the longest time, um, and obviously everyone is familiar here with the concept of adjuvant and, and the different delivery strategies, but really the our lack of a good tumor antigen has hampered probably most of the efforts uh, to date. And so here's really where new antigens come in, where a gene aberration, at least in principle, any gene aberration can encode for a, for a mutated peptide that gets processed in a tumor cell or an androgenic presenting cell and then presented to T cells. And so neuroantigens are at least in principle really good targets. Uh, and so just to differentiate them from pathogens here, when you, when you graph like the tumor specificity versus lack of um, immune tolerance, pathogens are here. Well, tumor specificity obviously doesn't really, at least for uh, with the exception of virally driven cancers, doesn't really play a role. But the, the majority of cancer vaccines to date have used these shared overexpressed tumor antigens that just have like they're not entirely specific to the tumor and they're also induced uh, central tolerance. And then, and so the tumor new antigens, there should be Entirely tumor specific, and they also they shouldn't have induced any any central tolerance. And so there's been actually in the clinic a lot of evidence that new antigens do play a role in different in various clinical contexts, which I'm not going to go into any detail. But certainly we have so, shown, for example, that response to PD1 inhibition is associated with a tumor mutational burden. And the other you know important point that I wanted to make here: the majority of mutations that encode for new antigens. Are private and not recurrent. So, we, so there's you know recurrent tumor mutations, something like KRAS and BRAF. But the the problem is that those are like only subsets of patients, and then the AGI restriction really you know um, sort of cuts the proportion of patients that would be even in theory uh, responsive to this down quite a bit. So that gets to sort the of personalization, where you essentially have to get tumor, you have to get healthy tissue, you have to hold, do a whole exome sequencing, RNA sequencing. And then have in silico prediction pipelines where you try to predict the best, um, the, the, the most highly immunogenic epitopes, right? And that could include class one binding, but it can also include a lot of other things. And so this is actually a quite uh, vigorous field of research now. How to best get at these most immunogenic new antigens based, based on whole exome sequencing. So when we started this 10 years ago, we went into a high-risk melanoma. We used a long peptide vaccine. We formulated it with poli-ICLC, a TLR3 agonist, and we vaccinated prime boost, as you can see here. And we um, pretty early on saw that we could actually generate quite robust immune responses. As you can see here, six patients, they all had interferon gamma responses at quite good magnitudes. I would say like another distinction between the the cancer field and the, the ID vaccine field is that you can publish in nature like just six patients. Um, as you would expect from, from um, this being a long peptide vaccine, um, we saw pre CD4 dominance, but we did see some CD8 responses. All the ex vivo responses, though, were CD4 in, in nature. We then, in that uh, first publication, really drilled down on these immune responses, looked at some of the features that are obviously important when you look at the, you know, the sort of the what should these immune responses look like. So they should be specific for the mutation versus the wild type. And so, yes, they were. 
those T cells that are specific for mutant, mutant peptide, they should also be able to actually recognize autologous tumor. You know, if you think, if you, if you hope that they, that they can actually kill tumor cells, they should broaden and then Hopefully, there should be actually a clinical evidence that they work. And actually, in our first study with those just simply six patients, we had two that had tumor um, recurrence while they were vaccinated. They then went on to receive PD-1 inhibition. Actually, both had a complete response that's that's durable to this day, which is like, you know, you would actually not necessarily expect with PD-1 inhibition alone. So it's sort of an early signal of potential clinical activity, which was certainly rewarding. Um, in a follow-up study from this first, we actually we added two patients, so we now have eight patients, and then looked at the durability of responses. So we actually had leukophoresis blood for all of these, uh, uh, the initial time points, but then also the long-term time points up to four and a half years out. And lo and behold, we actually did see immune responses at these long-term time points um, pretty consistency. What, what, what you see here on the left side is CD4 responses. On the right side is CD8 responses and the filled bars as essentially the proportion of epitopes that were recognized at the long-term time point on the right side as an example of this. We then did single cell analysis. We actually had, uh, we created tetramers where we, where we were able to, um, isolate neoapitope specific T cells and then look at single cell RNA seq and also TCR seq. And we actually found different clusters that we then could um, track down to um, represent a naive versus a cytotoxic versus a memory phenotype, which you see here on the uh, low, oops, on the, on the lower right side here. Uh, where as, as the vaccine response evolves, the proportion of naive cells goes down, then you, you go into cytotoxicity and activation use cell death, and then memory cell phenotypes goes up, just what, what you would expect with a, with a vaccine. We're also assessing TCR clonotypes over time so on a single cell level. We saw diversification as illustrated by the additional colors here from left to right. And then moving on from that first small study, we conducted a larger study that was done with Neon Therapeutics, which is actually founded out of the Dana-Farber effort. And in that study, we had um, 60 patients that were treated, the majority melanoma, but also there were lung cancer and bladder cancer patients. And we also did um, quite comprehensive immune analyses where we got serial leukophoresis for the majority of patients. We also got serial tumor biopsies, which is like quite a Quite a bit of an effort in a in a multi institutional trial, as you could imagine, um, particularly with the with it for the tumor biopsies. And on that study, again here we're looking at waterfall plots. So essentially, you're looking at tumor regression. Down is good, meaning like tumor shrinkage. And in melanoma, we we saw higher response rates that you would than, than you would expect from historical controls alone. So sixty percent versus roughly forty percent. And we actually also saw this. Um, deepening of the responses, as you can see, like the white bars versus the narrow bars, the white bar reflects sort of how the maximum um, regression. And so they deepened over time after the, after the vaccine. We saw similar results in the lung and the bladder cancer cohorts. Similar to the first study, we also did comprehensive analysis of all the epitopes that we had vaccinated with. Actually, I should have mentioned that we vaccinated with 20 neoantigens per patient. And we saw again that the majority of epitopes actually induced CD4 responses, and but there was also quite robust CD8 reactivity too. But that's also not exceedable in that larger study. We then, given that the stu study was not randomized and we couldn't really definitively show any sort of vaccine-induced cytotoxicity, we looked at a phenomenon called epitope spreading, which some of you may may be familiar, right? So it's essentially in the in the tumor context is tumor gets tumor cells get killed, they release antigens after vaccination. Those antigens are, um, they're, they're brought in sort of the repertoire of targets and they could actually then, then themselves like trigger new immune responses. So if, if you see this after vaccination, this could uh, suggest uh, vaccine-induced tumor cell killing. And in fact, that's what we saw. Um, as I said, in, for all tumor types, melanoma, lung, and bladder cancer, you could see that um, patients that had been a clinical benefit, meaning like they had responses that were durable, had a higher um, amount of epitope spreading, and this actually so this, this tracked really with the with the, with the outcome. So uh, again, sort of showing this graphically. Another endpoint that we looked at was um, 
tumor regression in, in these serial tumor biopsies that I told you about. And we actually had um, out of 14 patients, um, five had a response rate already after PD-1 inhibition. Actually, I should have pointed out that so the way the study was designed, this patient started PD-1 inhibition while the vaccines were made. Uh, and then after three months, they started with a vaccination. So you basically have these serial time points where you can look at, this is basically what happened after PD-1 inhibition. And so five patients already had a complete response, which is great for them, but doesn't tell you anything about the vaccine, right? Uh, but there was also nine patients who did not have a path response after the PD-1 inhibition, but they didn't, all of them actually went on to have complete responses in these biopsies. And this observation also tracked with clinical benefits. So it's suggestive that there could actually, in this metastatic setting, there could be a clinical benefit for the vaccines. So now this is obviously a very um, uh, active field. There's a lots of, lots of player, mainly industry, but also some academic efforts. BioNTech and Moderna are probably the most prominent ones, and also the pro most prominent ones in terms of recent results, which I wanted to quickly highlight here. Um, the first one is a study that was just published actually Nature, like last week, where Vinod Balachandran and his team, in, co in collaboration with the, uh, the BioNTech group uh, in Germany, vaccinated 16 patients that had surgically resectable pancreatic cancer. So a very, like, cold tumor, very difficult to treat with immunotherapy, if at all. Um, and they basically asked the question whether in this secondary prevention study, similar to actually our melanoma study, right, right, those patients were also at high risk for recurrence, whether this could, um, whether they could see activity of the vaccine, whether they could see immune responses. And they had quite striking um, observations. Number one was they essentially defined immunogenicity with, when they, when they, in one patient saw two things happening. One, um, by TCR, so by bulk TCR beta, TCRV beta sequencing, come new clones that came up after vaccination, and then also interferon gamma alley spot. And so I just want to focus your attention on those here. So there's like the ones that they call responders, where you see like the clones coming up after vaccination versus in the non-responders. This, this is sort of discounted um, because in that non-responder group, there was not one patient who had an interferon gamma alley spot versus in the responder group, there was everybody had at least one epitope that was recognized and where interferon gamma alley spot was positive. And so when they compared those two groups, they can, and looked at the recurrence free survival, turns out that there was not a single recurrence in the patient that the immune responses versus like two out of, uh, six out of eight of the non-immune responders had a recurrence. So it's quite strike. It's not a randomized study, but it's quite suggestive that there could be some clinical activity. And they actually had really interesting correlative, uh, additional correlative data where they, for example, also looked at COVID responses of these patients that didn't see any, any response. Because an obvious question would be like, well, did they just have like less immunogenicity, but they they, they looked. They also looked at. Uh, um, they, they got tezolizumab, which is a PDL1 inhibitor in combination. They also so they did quite comprehensive work to actually rule out that this is just like immune response and not related to the vaccine. Probably the most important study for the field, and this is really uh, I can't um, understate like how how important this is for, for the field. I'd say to specifically for the personalized cancer vaccine field but also for the field of cancer vaccine is this Moderna study where they vaccinated, and we actually participated on this study, um, patient with stage three melanoma with the RNA vaccine and randomized 150 patients, two to one, so basically 100 patients get pembrolizumab plus vaccine versus 50 patients only get uh, pembrolizumab alone. And they actually did see a difference in recurrence-free survival, which is quite um remarkable for a cancer vaccine trial because it, this has really not been shown in a randomized study. It's still early days, I'd say. There's like some um, some issues where there was like a little bit of a disbalance in terms of the tumor mutation burden, some other things. The numbers are obviously small, but I would say it's it's quite encouraging. There's other clinical uh, signal, which I'm not going to go into detail now because I wanted to sort of leave enough time for discussion. And so I just wanted to uh, address a few um, slides about the, the, the challenges, op the opportunities that we have in the field. So the biggest one that, that almost always comes up, like, well, personalized vaccines are expensive. You have to do them for, you have to customize them for every single patient. It takes time and it's costly. So kind of work on that. I would say my argument um, to that is like it's actually already happening. Like at BioNTech, they have actually got, gone down with the, the production timelines to four four weeks now. 
when the, in the initial trial it took like 16 to 20 weeks. So I think that's quite uh, successful. I would also say there's actually not, there's no biological barrier to this timeline, right? So it's not like you have to, you know, grow cells and culture. And for example, with some cell therapies, you have to like grow cells and culture for like three weeks. There's nothing you can do to like, you know, abbreviate that time front. So there's, there's a lot to be, be done and scaling up and automation can certainly help. I think we can always, I don't have to tell you guys, we can have work. We can work on better adherence, better combination therapies to really increase the magnitude and the quality of the vaccine-induced immune responses um, to, you know, enhance T-cell priming and so forth. I think specifically for cancer vaccines, we do have to address what's happening in the tumor. So I think it would be, you know, certainly there's some hope because there's actually studies ongoing in a metastatic setting that simply vaccination and PD-1 inhibition alone may, you know, induce responses. Um, but you probably have to add other drugs to actually account for immunosuppression in the tumor microenvironment. And then there's like this whole um, broad arena of neoangine discovery. How do you identify the best, the most immunogenic neoangines? And then hopefully, how do you actually expand the space? Because so far, we are actually only harnessing the single nuclear variants and indels because that's what you get from whole exome sequencing. But if you do, if you um, use more more sophisticated sequencing technologies, you can actually uh, potentially use mutations that are actually better because they're like more de novo. You, you get rather than just having one amino acid changed in, in your peptide, you could actually change the entire peptide. And so there's certainly lo lots of work going on uh, in there. And there's like, well, we wrote some review and recently, or just like what was one of the things that we were, that we discussed, actually like my colleagues in that, in that review paper. And so this is my last slide. This is just very high level, you know, conclusions. Um, we have shown that this is feasible. I think it's an important point to actually show feasibility is safe and the vaccines are really remarkably immunogenic compared to what we had before. Um, we saw this long-term persistence of the immune responses, which I think is important. There's lots of platforms that are being developed by lots of different companies and then academic efforts. We do have preliminary, pre preliminary efficacy signals. And I think the Moderna, as I, as I mentioned, that, that is like really, um, if that pans out and industry is already like working pretty hard and sort of harness it as like the folks at Merck are already planning like much larger studies. So they really put a lot of money into, into those results. I would say like it's still relatively early days. So looking forward to the Q and A. Thank you so much. Wow. Diana. Hi, this is Christiana from Italy. I have a very naive question because I'm, I, I don't know really the field. So um, in terms of safety and concentrations that you use, for instance, for an mRNA therapeutic vaccine, how does this compare with uh, preventive vaccines? And can some safety profiles be helpful also for preventive vaccines? Because probably the concentration range are different. I don't know. So I want to say, so we use peptide vaccines. So there's a lot of obviously like pharmacology to the RNA vaccines, but I'm, I don't really want to venture out and like speculate. I, uh, there's certainly the there's one and there's a, one of you guys probably like even know better than I do, but there's a, a, a very um, key difference between, for example, the COVID vaccines and the cancer vaccines in how the RNA is like made up, right? So it's like help me out here, guys. But it's like that's something that I'm just blanking on. It's basically just like the I was gonna say Moderna. Anyone from Moderna going once? <laughs> Pfizer. Oh, I don't know the field. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, 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 it's just like the, the RNA, how you make up the RNA. So, for example, like in the, the cancer vaccine, right, it's it's like a nanoparticle that's infused, right? It's not an IM shot. So it's like the pharmacology is very different. Now from BioNTech, um, they actually have all these preclinical data where they show that the, the antigen presentation happens in the spleen. And they, so they did a lot of work to formulate their vaccine. You know, I would say immunogenicity, efficacy, the probably also looked at tox. Um, I can't really, you know, speculate on like the R the tox of the RNA and like the pharmacology, which I will say like with the, the neoantigen vaccines as a, with the neoantigens as a target, the safety is like been really not been an issue. So it's not like we have seen anything sort of you know 
issues like was that were seen, for example, at the at the NCI when they did cell therapy trials with like self antigens, where people had like no, and there was actually death of that, right? Um, we haven't seen, and in our study, we haven't seen any toxicity. And from what I understand, like the RNA vaccines, like the, the, the toxicity mainly that they were combined with PDL1 inhibition was mainly from the PDL1 inhibition. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. And this is from South Africa. I just wanted, maybe I missed that part. I just wanted to know how would these vaccines work on, you know, genetic related malignancies and also any, you know, plans to explore universal cancer vaccine rather than speci uh, focusing specifically on a uh, specific cancer? Thanks. So, um, it's a, so the, there are efforts to use universal vaccines by, so that I think there's like two different questions, right? One is like, um, if you really want to take advantage of the, the mutational spectrum in the tumor, you have to personalize, right? But that's obviously, as I pointed out, that's, that's difficult. Um, but there have been effort to create an off the shelf vaccine by essentially taking advantage of the, the fact that you know, there's these driver mutations. And then, there, for example, a company called Gridstone, they have, they put in like 50, um, 50 new engines that are encoded by these driver mutations, right? So you can basically, there's like some KRAS and there's some different KRAS mutation. There's like EGFR mutation, all this stuff. But the, the problem with those is like, you still have the HLA restriction, right? So there, most of these peptides will be like HLA A2 or they, um, they will encompass like an uh, MHC spectrum as large as possible, but you will vaccinate, you will end up vaccinating with a product where basically probably 90% or even more of your targets are not relevant in the host because they just don't have the right HLA or they, or they, the, the tumors don't have the recurrence. In terms of like, so that's a universal vaccine for that reason, I don't think it's possible, right? Yeah, thank you, Patrick. So this is a question, and maybe actually Anna, you also have some thought on this. From coming from the preventive vaccine side, we talk about antibodies, and that's all we often can measure, especially if you license vaccines. So you open this entire field of T cell responses, um, you know, tetramers and stuff like that. And I understand, you know, the licensing process is obviously different. Um, in the vaccine development space, usually we have this issue. We need to have well-standardized, scalable, validated tests that, you know, are just easy to employ. And that's just happening with a humoral immune response. So how can we, on our side of the vaccine development, leverage this terrific experience that you gain with <laughs> T-cell responses, you know, to kind of help our understanding for example, of viral vaccines and T cell responses, find better correlate of protections and so forth. So I wonder whether I mean, did I, what did I, what did we solve? I think we just so in, in the cancer vaccine where we have always focused on the T cell response, right? I mean, I, I would actually venture, I would actually say like we're prob probably a little bit too much, right? We know, like at least in the even in the, in the concept of checkpoint inhibition, right? We learn now about. Uh, uh, the tertiary lymphoid structure and sort of appreciating the B cell a little bit more, but we certainly wouldn't like use an ELISA as like a measurement of like a tumor immune response. In terms of like, I, I think I'm too much on the academic side to really like answer the question. I, I will say like, we haven't seen any immune data from the Moderna study and this excitement is still like, you know, literally like the companies are already investing like billions of dollars, right? They haven't seen, they have like no idea what the T cell response are. So, so in terms of the, the, the regulatory in the cancer field, I don't think like these assays are, if, if anything, it's the opposite, right? We have like done all these like immune assays. And they, our first study, right? It's like, it's sort of fancy immune analysis, but at the end of the day, like, well, does it work, right? <laughs> is one you know. And I think we, you can't really track in, in, in the, in the cancer, just like it seems like in, in viral, well, it seems like in the viral vaccine has more of actually a correlation between like an essay and like efficacy. Whereas in cancer vaccine, I would argue like it's almost like nothing. I mean, it's, it's hard to come up with. Yeah. That. And, and as sort of a follow up for that, I mean, I think part of it is you're looking at small numbers, right? And you're looking at yeah. outcome. Have, are there efforts within each group to go back and say, see what T cell response or what, you know, when we're looking at, at all the, metabolics and things like that, what can we find anything that correlates with that regression? Is that ongoing work or is it just we're seeing tumor regression 
So we're good to go. We have like drilled down deep, right? And tried. Um, but like, exactly what I say, like, we know we are like two responders, like whatever, there, there's nothing you can come up with. In the, in the larger study that I said, that, so we, I would say like the epitope spreading is maybe as far, and then that's actually being built into some of the trials or in, where, where you actually look at, this is, that has been really quite striking. I didn't present all the data, but we sort of, epitope basically what you do is like you, and this is like a, the, the personal as vaccine are, are a good setting to test for this because you basically, when you run your prediction pipelines, you basically say in melanoma, you get like a hundred targets. You pick your 20 best ones, but then you have like 80 other targets that you like, you know, they're like targets. They're like have RNA um, support. You know, there's mutations that are in the tumor, but they never make another vaccine. So you can basically see whether you can get responses against those non-vaccinating epitopes, like after vaccination, right? And the data was very clear. So there was not one response prior to the vaccination, even after PD-1 inhibition, but then after the vaccination, you had these, you know, you know, up to 30% of these vaccinate of the non-vaccinating um, new antigens induced responses. So showing epitope spreading, and I showed you that it, it correlates. I would still say like the numbers are so low that he could not say like, oh, this patient had epitope spreading, there may be a responder. Oncologists, they want to see like what I showed you, waterfall plots, right? <laughs> Does it work? Yeah. So if you would want to improve the T-cell response to a, a vaccine for an infectious disease, what would you uh, advise for timing of these combining a checkpoint inhibitor and the vaccine, and, and how would you administer it? I, you know, honestly, I think I, I was hoping I get some answers from you guys here. <laughs> It's like, you know, we have, you know I, I give you one example. For example, uh, uh, the PD-1 inhibition, there was work from Arlene Sharp, like from the, from the, the Brigham, um, that's in, in mouse models, suggesting that if you do PD-1 inhibition, it may actually, like, compromise memory T-cell formation, right? And so in our group, like, three years ago, I was like, you cannot do this study because you need to PD-2. You cannot give PD-1 inhibition before a vaccine, right? From, like, the, the immunologist. But then the, 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 clini the clinicians are like, well, if you do it in this and this tumor, you have to give P1 inhibition, right? I would argue now the clinical data, right? I mean, those patients, all of the Moderna patients, they all got like PD-1 inhibition initially. And they, uh, as I said, we haven't seen any immune responses. Uh, but, but even in, in our, in the study that, that we did, that everybody got PD-1 inhibition. So that's just, a, that's just an example. But I think in terms of learning, like, about priming, it's, it's very empiric. I mean, our prime boost was complete, at least like, you know, looking at mouse data and sort of doing it, giving it the best shot. One example, another example is like we actually um, did not use montanite for, and then montanite has been used in a lot of vaccines. We're actually doing it now. But the reason why we didn't do it initially was a study that was done in mice that was published in 2013, um, William Overwick basically showed if you do montanite as an adjuvant, all the T cells kind of die at the site of the vaccination. They don't make it a tumor. And you're like, oh, geez, this data, I can't use it, right? But I, I, you know, in retrospect, actually, I wish we had a, would have done that. So I don't think we – it's moving too slowly, right? I mean, ideally – and I think that this actually goes larger, right? I mean, um, I would also love to see comparative studies where you do, like, different regimens, different adjuvants. It's um, – particularly with a personal vaccine, it's very difficult to do. But then, but of course, in the non-personalized, you don't really get reliable immune responses. So that's, that's a little bit of a conundrum. So we have an adjuvant expert. Go. Yeah, first, first I will comment on the, on the previous question with the combination of checkpoint inhibitors. It is true that, well, PD-1 is really important for shutdown of the, on the, of the lymph nodes to get proper antigen presentation and germinal sensor formation and all these things. So if you do it in combination, you might simply reduce your immune responses. For, second of all, there are also diseases that actually, where, where it can be fatal to use checkpoint inhibitors, tuberculosis, for example. It is known that if you have latent TB, using checkpoint inhibitors can actually activate the TB. So, so, so it, it's, it's, you know, this combination in checkpoint inhibitors, we should really be careful to use that in a, in, in, in the prophylactic space. Um, but I agree. 
But, I, but I think you would, you would not even like a PD-1 inhibitor, you could not give in a prophylactic space. I mean, they're too toxic, right? So I think it's just like, that's just apples and oranges, right? I mean, patients like with cancer, it's like a very, and it's in a way like, that's a different risk. It's risk a, such a different risk. That, that, that in some sense, that's also like, for example, why we have these like thousands of trials, right? And then, then you can talk about like the money that goes into the field and all these things, right? So there's a lot of things that are being done. Most of them, I would say, are pretty empiric. Yeah. So may, may I comment on the other one, yeah. on the on the CD4, t- on the T-cell responses? I think we can learn a lot from other prophylactic fields. We have the TB field that has done fantastic CD4 uh, and CD8 evaluations in clinical trials over many, many years. I suppose they'll make sure... Can interferon failed as a predictor? Oh, yeah, that's true, those. but they can do the CD4 T-cell yes. evaluation. That it was not the right correlate for checking. That's another thing. <laughs> right. What happened? So then from India, does the junction opening protein help the T-cells to do the tumor cleaning? The junction of what? Junction opening proteins. Of new proteins? Junction openers. Junction openers. Not familiar with the term. Junction openers? Are there a class of protein which, like, um, you know, helps the tumor to decimate and then uh, probably the T-cells could uh, work in a better way? I, I've, I've never heard about the term junction openers. Sorry. Yes, one last question. Sorry, very naive. Um, for personalized cancer vaccines, I'm curious about um, the, the general age groups. Is it mostly adults? And then do you expect, or are there uh, studies showing differences in you know the elderly, the adults? Do you even have any? Uh, studies in, in the in the children in the younger age group or person? No, so yeah, I would say even like with. So with a personal vaccine, definitely not. The, I, 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 there may be like across the world, there may be, I'm sure there's like some children that were vaccinated with this but just on a single patient IND, compassionate care, mm-hmm. but I don't think there's any data from, from that. Even with, so I can tell you like this obviously different, would be a different question, but with a, with a checkpoint inhibition, actually we don't really see a lot of differences between age groups. So at least for example, in melanoma, like you can have like, Really good responses in like ninety year olds, and good response in twenty years. So, it's, and and but uh, you know, it's like the one of the challenges with these studies is usually it's retrospective and and not particularly reliable data, right? 